Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for spending your Saturday morning here. Hopefully, you will find this informative, helpful, and worth your while. Um, as Dr. Stiff mentioned, I am a transplant physician, hematologist, oncologist at Loyola. And my, my talk today will be um, on new approaches to unrelated donor transplantation. Um, so we'll review what transplant is to make sure we're all on the same page. We'll discuss areas for improvement, um, focusing on a few. So allogeneic stem cell transplantation is um, a transplant transplantation using cells from um, a donor. It is the only curative treatment for high risk or recurrent blood cancers, as well as certain uh, non-malignant blood disorders. Um, so as we mentioned, this process requires a donor um, as your source of stem cells. In preparation for the transplant, the recipient will undergo conditioning chemotherapy. The purpose of this is to eradicate any residual leukemia cells, even in people who are in remission. Um, and importantly, it also suppresses their immune system so that they will accept and not reject those donor stem cells. Once the chemotherapy has cleared out of their system, uh, the stem cells are infused on what we call day zero. Um, so typically within the first couple of weeks, most people will engraft their donor cells um, and start to produce normal blood cells. Amongst those blood cells are new cells for a new immune system, which hopefully will develop into what we call a graft versus tumor effect. This is where these new um, donor cells will identify residual um, tumor cells as foreign and therefore um, mount an attack. So this immune system develops over the first months to even a year or beyond after transplantation. During this time, we monitor closely for complications such as infection, um, as well as uh, graft versus host disease, otherwise known as GVHD. Just as we expect that the donor cells will identify leukemia or tumor cells as foreign, the possibility also exists that these same donor cells may identify the recipient as foreign. Therefore, all recipients receive immune suppression for a period of time after transplantation to prevent GVHD, which is what we call GVHD prophylaxis. Uh, so here I highlight uh, some key points during the transplant process, which are all also active areas of research in transplant medicine currently. Um, and uh, during this discussion, we'll focus on a few of them. So let's start with the donor. Given a choice, our first choice of donor is typically a match-related donor. This is a sibling who's matched eight out of eight at locations called HLAA, B, C, and DR. These are encoded on chromosome six, of which we inherit two copies, one from our mother and one from our father. Unfortunately, only about 80, 30% uh, of people have a matched sibling donor. In most cases, typically the next preferred um, donor choice is a matched unrelated donor. This is also someone who is matched eight out of eight, um, but is typically found through one of the worldwide registries. Uh, Caucasians have the highest chance of finding a match at around 60 to 70 percent, while most minorities have about a 20 to 40 percent chance of finding a matched unrelated donor. This leaves approximately 5,000 people a year uh, without a donor, um, and for these people we have advanced approaches with what we call alternative donors so that these people have the opportunity to undergo this potentially life-saving treatment. So with alternative donors, just about everyone has a donor in this day and age. You might uh, be able to do so that these donors are um, less matched or more mismatched and therefore require more intensive strategies to prevent rejection as well as graft versus host disease. Nonetheless, they make, it po they make transplant possible for many who would otherwise be unable to undergo transplantation. So the first uh, type of alternative donor is what we call a mismatched unrelated donor. These are uh, donors who are mismatched at one location um, or else are a seven out of eight match. 
the risks and deleterious effects of HLA match are pretty well documented and accepted. Um, in a review of the NMDB um, registry, including about 30, over 3,500 transplants some years ago, they were able to see a, a clear association between survival and degree of HLA match. They estimate um, approximately a 9 to 10% decrement in survival with each HLA mismatch. So the main benefits or strengths of the mismatched unrelated donor are again the availability to a larger proportion of people and in some, ex some cases um, we've seen decreased relapse which suggests possibly an increased graft versus tumor effect. The downsides to mismatched uh, donors are obviously related to the degree of mismatch, uh, which can be associated with increased risk of graft versus host disease, as well as increased transplant um, complications, and ultimately impaired survival in certain cases. There is currently an active um, study sponsored by the NMDP taking place at multiple centers that looks to address uh, the issues with mismatch by combining it with a process called post-transplantation cyclophosphamide. This is a, um, which I'll discuss more in the next slide, but it's a method of GVHD prophylaxis um, and um, which has become very popular in recent years and the results to the study may help us clarify whether mismatched unrelated donors remain um, a prime alternative option. So what is post-transplant cyclophosphamide? Without getting too much into the science and details of it, um, what I can say is cyclophosphamide is actually one of our oldest chemotherapies. We know that it specifically targets highly proliferative cells. So by strategically timing it to be given a few days after the stem cell infusion, it will target what we call alloreactive cells. Alloreactive cells refer to donor cells that become activated when they are exposed to the foreign recipient environment. In response, some of the cells will become activated and highly proliferative, and these cells are potentially implicated in the future development of complications such as GVHD. So these cells are the ones that are more sensitive to the cyclophosphamide, and importantly, the quiescent cells, um, which are felt to be um, required for the eventual development of an appropriately developing uh, immune system, are spared. So this is a GVHD prophylaxis, prophylaxis technique that has become um, popular in the past few years and is being um, applied in multiple settings um, at this time and shows a lot of promise, um, including in this next approach, which is um, using haploidentical donors. So haploidentical donors are otherwise defined as half-matched or half-mismatched donors. They are typically a first-degree relative, and this picture kind of shows us um, why. When I say first-degree relative, I mean either a parent, a sibling, or a child. And so you can see here, um, parents each inherit one haplotype from their parents, and then they pass one along to their children. So if you look at this, um, at that first progeny, AC, you can see that they are half matched with each of their, with each of his parents, as well as most of his siblings. And if he has children, then he will be half matched to probably all of his children as well. So the main benefits of haploidentical donors are, again, they're readily available to the really, the vast majority of people. Um, this is a, a very economical strategy in that you circumvent requiring a registry search. Since they are first degree relatives, they're typically there, they're ready to go, they're motivated. Um, it saves time and money. Um, importantly, that donor remains available for further cell therapies, um, which is um, possibly one of its biggest strengths. The downsides to the haploidentical donor, again, relate to the HLA mismatch that is inherent. And so with um, initial um, attempts at using this donor, um, they saw inappropriately high rates of graft versus host disease, relapse, rejection, 
However, um, why we're talking about this is because in recent years, um, Johns Hopkins um, has advanced an approach um, combining this with, again, this post-transplant cyclophosphamide technique. And using this approach, um, they and other um, centers have been able to achieve um, remarkably improved um, outcomes. So um, haploidentical transplantation with post-transplantation with post-transplant cyclophosphamide remains um, a very um, active area of research. Um, another approach that people have taken to address the HLA mismatch with um, haploidentical donors is by trying to manipulate the graft. Um, scientists have uh, tried to determine what are harm potentially harmful cells and what are potentially helpful cells, and using this information, um, there, is, um, there is currently an interest in trying to deplete some of the potentially harmful cells, such as alpha, beta, T cells, and then adding back um, uh, beneficial cells. So this is um, an active area of research. Overall, um, haploidentical um, transplant is the fastest, uh, is the most, is the fastest growing uh, donor source today and it is most likely due to the combination of being an economical um, graft source as well as um, the donor being available. Um, with the donor being available for future collections as well as uh, collections with cell manipulations, um, haploidentical transplant is felt to be an excellent platform to investigate uh, future post-transplant cellular therapies. The last uh, hap, um, alternative donor source is one that I think is arguably the most interesting immunologically. This is uh, cord blood. This is the blood remaining in the placenta and in the cord after childbirth. It, com um, it contains a combination of cells, both from the mother and the fetus. And it is a representation of a very unique um, situation in nature whereby you have two individuals, the mother and the fetus, who are not identical to each other. They coexist for nine months sharing a blood supply, yet do not immuno immunologically attack each other. This tolerant um, environment that occurs and that is represented in the cord blood is thought to be a result of having uh, more naive, less reactive immune cells, as well as um, higher numbers of regulatory cells that keep things in check. So um, the, the main benefits of cord blood is that there is less stringent HLA matching um, required in order to find an appropriate cord blood unit. This is again likely related to the presence of those less reactive, more naive cells. Um, and similarly, um, in some experiences, we have seen less GVHD with this approach. Importantly, this is not at the sacrifice of um, increased uh, relapse, as we have seen um, evidence of good graft versus tumor effect with cord blood. Uh, the main downsides of cord blood relate mainly to the limited um, cell doses. So unlike adult donors, where we can collect and collect to a cell dose that is predictable and that is um, adequate, what you have is what you get with cord blood. You can't, make, you can't get any more than what is there. Um, so these limited cell doses um, can result in delayed and unpredictable count recovery, um, increased transplant-related complications. And um, another downside of cord blood is that it is, relatively speaking, expensive um, because they are stored in cord banks. The alternate side of that is that they're also readily available. They're off the shelf. They're very quick. Um, they're there when you need them. So in order to um, address the issue of limited cell doses, there are various approaches that are currently being studied. At some institutions, they will um, infuse two cords at the same time in what we call double cord transplantation. Uh, at the University of Chicago, locally, they um, have advanced an approach called haplocord transplantation. This is where they co-infuse a haploidentical graft along with the cord blood. Um, and the purpose of that haplograft is that it does provide early and reliable engraftment and therefore recovery of blood counts, but actually over time, in the majority of people, the cord um, cells will eventually take over engraftment and then provide um, durable 
um, um, cell function. Um, at Loyola and at other centers, we have investigated an approach called ex vivo expansion. This is where the cord um, blood cells are expanded in the lab um, to increase the number of cells um, before they are infused into the patient. Um, all of these approaches have actually shown um, good promise and, and good results, and at this time, the optimal approach is, is still not clear, and um, these studies um, um, are still underway. So overall, these are the alternative donor sources, and um, at this point, you know, what is the best or, um, yeah, what is the best alternative donor is still unclear and remains um, an area of active um, research. So enough about the donor, now let's turn to the patient. Um, so anyone who undergoes a transplantation undergoes a very uh, rigorous and comprehensive pre-transplant evaluation. The purpose of this is mainly to ensure that uh, the patient is healthy enough, fit enough, and has adequate resources to safely undergo a transplantation. Um, the second uh, reason for this evaluation is so that we can actually identify vulnerabilities or areas that we need to address or improve on before transplantation. So this comprehensive pre-transplant workup certainly includes a thorough medical evaluation so that we can identify other comorbidities and involve specialists if we need to, both uh, before, during, and after transplantation. Um, it is also important to make sure that their disease is adequately treated. Ideally, we go into transplant with as little disease as possible, and therefore it is Im important that um, disease is optimally treated. Um, we also look um, at performance status, which is the functioning and endurance, and this has been shown, clearly shown to be uh, very important uh, in transplant outcomes. In addition, we assess nutrition, psychological um, status, as well as social support. It does not matter how strong, healthy, um, um, it does not, no, there is no person who can undergo a transplant on their own. Um, it always requires a caregiver um, support system, um, and so that is something that is established and clarified before the transplant can go forward. And lastly, we will also look at um, the financial situation so that we can make sure that um, all medication, services, and such will be affordable and um, available after the transplantation. Um, in spite of all of that um, comprehensive pre-transplant workup, there are efforts to further try, to further try and improve things from the patient standpoint. And um, to kind of highlight a few um, approaches. At Loyola, we will soon be opening um, a basically a Fitbit study. Um, in the study, we will be looking at whether wearing Fitbits um, might increase um, patients' activity shortly after the transplant, and ultimately whether that will decrease deconditioning, shorten hospital stays, um, decrease transplant complications, um, as well as improve quality of life. So that is something that will be opening soon um, with us. Uh, at the University of Chicago, for the past several years, they've had a program called the Transplant Optimiz Optimization Program. It is a program um, geared towards the geriatric population, but they will also evaluate people who are um, perceivably what we call frail, either multiple medical issues or um, potentially um, complicated medically. So in this program, they incorporate a comprehensive geriatric assessment, um, but they also make use of other markers and evaluations and are actively um, investigating whether some of them um, might be helpful in the future and more generally applied. Um, other um, efforts to try and improve um, the um, Transplants uh, from the recipient side um, include refining uh, risk assessment tools that we currently have. We often use these tools before transplant to help us determine who is appropriate for transplantation. Um, and 
you know, these tools are never perfect, and so therefore there are efforts um, ongoing to try and improve these tools, and also um, assessments to determine whether combining these tools might give us more information and better ability to um, optimize uh, patient selection. So lastly, I do want to talk a little bit about post-transplant um, possibilities. So um, improving post-transplant outcomes, um, we know that relapse is still a possibility after transplant and that is um, certainly something that we would like to be able to decrease and so um, this is what prompts um, this interest in post-transplant uh, treatments. So um, our goal with post-transplant uh, treatments is to enhance graft versus tumor effect and therefore decrease relapse, um, improve um, immune reconstitution and therefore decrease risk of infections as well as secondary malignancies. And lastly, um, to decrease graft versus host disease, which is very important to post-transplant quality of life. So efforts um, that are currently available um, locally um, at Loyola, we have a post-transplant maintenance uh, trial where uh, patients are given a combination of azacitidine and valproic acid. It is felt that this combination of drugs um, are potentially synergistic as they have been observed in, um, in the lab. And the hope is that it helps uh, boost the immune system and hopefully decrease relapse um, in the end. And this is an ongoing study. Uh, at, at the University of Chicago, they also have a post-transplant um, study looking at prophylactic donor lymphocyte infusion. So this is an instance where you do require the donor to be available um, to collect additional cells which are um, infused um, after transplant. Again, the idea is um, to hopefully boost the immune system and improve the graft versus tumor effect and ultimately to decrease relapse. Other approaches that are currently being investigated or, or put together are the application of other um, treatments such as checkpoint inhibitors, molecular targeted therapies, which were discussed in the last, um, or some of which were touched upon in the last talk, um, as well as vaccines and cell therapies. So this is, a, this is definitely a, a big area of, of interest and one uh, to kind of keep your eye out on um, because this is uh, definitely a growing field. So transplant, um, as you can see, is a very complicated um, procedure. It is, in fact, a life-threatening, though potentially life-saving, but always life-changing therapy. Uh, no doubt you will have had many and will have uh, many questions. Um, I encourage you to, um, if you are required to undergo transplant, write them all down, get them answered, um, and make sure you are um, um, aware of what's going on and in, in, in the game. <laughs>